everyone. Welcome back. I am the Electrical Code Coach. I'm really excited about today's video. Today we're going to look at the five common fails on panel changes. So instead of sitting around and talking for five minutes about stuff that isn't going to help you level up, let's get to it. Number one, the height of overcurrent devices. Now this one can be real tricky because there's a huge misnomer in the industry. Let's talk about it now. The code comes from 240.24a, and it states that circuit breakers or switches containing fuses, they shall be in a readily accessible location and also so that the center grip of the operating handle when it's in its highest position is not more than six foot seven above the floor or working platform unless you hit some of the exceptions down below or some of the uh, allowances that allow you to do a little bit differently, but it's not going to be normal circumstances. Any of the things that I teach about today, there's always going to be exceptions. We're talking about the code at face value and what's going to apply to you out in the field. So this one is really common because many people know that the middle of the main breaker is not allowed to be higher than six foot seven. And that statement is true. The middle of the main breaker is not allowed to be higher than six foot seven. But what about the picture on the right? Sometimes you have to turn your panel upside down. And as long as the breaker goes left to right, that's completely legal, unless your listing instructions say that it can't be flipped upside down. But what a lot of people don't realize is this code is talking about all overcurrent devices. It does not have to necessarily be just the main. So that's any of these overcurrent devices cannot be over six foot seven. And in my opinion, if I was your inspector, no part of the bus that can receive breakers is allowed to be higher than six foot seven. So this is a very common failed inspection point. Now your inspector may physically make you move the panel down. It happens all the time. They may allow you to build a platform that will get the, you know, that breaker in that six foot seven range. It's all up to your electrical inspector. And this is one that you definitely have to watch out for. Many times have people been hit on this one. It's a common fail. This is number one. Number two bonding bushings. And this one's going to be found in 250.92 B. And this picture on the left here is a really good example. You can see that they do not have a bonding bushing, so this would be a fail. There's nothing worse than when you've got the pressure on you doing a panel change, you got someone's power out, you're you know, moving right along, you're not thinking about that rigid metal nipple or some other type of metal nipple in between the meter and the inside panel. Now this obviously is only going to apply if you're 2017 and previous because now you'd have to have a disconnect on the exterior of the structure and it changes those conductors that go from inside to outside from service conductors to feeder conductors. So normally bonding bushings are not required on lower voltage things like 250 volt and under. But when you're dealing with service conductors, which are the conductors in between the metering equipment and the first point of disconnect, there are a different set of rules that you have to play by. And we find them here in part B of 250.92. This is in the bonding section of 250, and we're talking about services. And I'm going to let you work out with your electrical inspector if they require this bonding bushing no matter what on service conductors, or if it's only when you're dealing with an impaired connection, and I'll explain what I mean. Let's read what the code says. It says bonding jumpers meeting the requirements of this article shall be used around impaired connections, such as reducing washers, oversized concentric or eccentric knockouts, talking about the knockouts in the side of the panel. It lets you know that standard lock nuts or bushings shall not be the only means for the bonding that's required in this section. And then it gives you a prescription of a couple ways that you can satisfy it. Often the easiest way to satisfy it is by installing a bonding bushing, something that looks like this. Or you can use a bonding wedge as long as it's listed for the purpose. They also have two-piece bonding ones just in case you make a mistake and you have to put it on later. But this is a real common often miss thing and oftentimes people have to undo the wire put the bonding bushing on and then hook all the wires back up when they're waiting for the inspector to come back to get somebody's power back on so this is one that you really want to pay attention to when you're doing panel changes
Number three, improperly bonding or unbonding the panel. So this is going to be found in a couple different code references. It's the same code. It just depends on what cycle you're in. So in the 2017 and 2020, it's 250.24A5. Same code, but in the 2023, it's 250.24B. And what we're talking about here is separating grounds and neutrals on the load side of the service. Now, if you're at the first point of disconnect, meaning you have a meter outside and and your first panel is the first point of disconnect, at that point, we're going to connect all the grounds and neutrals. And make sure you work with your electrical inspector on this one, because if you don't get this one right, you can cause big problems. And I've got a video all about when and why to separate grounds and neutrals. If you've not seen it, just head over to YouTube, type in when and why to separate grounds and neutrals. It takes just a few minutes, and you guys will fully understand what's going on in that scenario. With that being said, this is one of the biggest failed inspection points, and it's one of the most important that you make sure you get right. Number four, grounding and bonding. And we're just going to call this one all of Article 250 because there's so many different failed inspection points that happen right here. Common ones are ground rods, only having one of them. We have to have two ground rods if we drive one. Footing grounds, either missing or not accessible. This one gets hit all the time on new construction homes. The carpenters cut it off. The masons bury it. The excavator buries it. This is a really important one. It has to be accessible and it also has to be present. The next one is water line ground, either undersized or missing. And this is one that we're going to look at here. So we have to, if it's available, we have to use the water line ground as our grounding electrode if it's one of the available electrodes. At the same time, we also have to bond our water line. It's often either undersized or missing. And at the same time, we have to bond our gas line if it's likely to be energized or your inspector just requires it of you. Oftentimes, it is undersized or missing. Many different points on each one of these individual ones can also hit you. Having the wrong clamps, they're not rated for a direct bury, not having the you know proper setup for the condition that you're in. So there's just so many different points that you can get hit on in Article 250. That's why it's excellent that if you've got time, it's a quick read. You can read almost all of Article 250. I've got tons of content on Article 250. We couldn't get into each one of these points on this one because it would make a full 25 minute video of its own. So for that one, we're just going to call it grounding and bonding. And finally, labeling the panel. Now, I've not listed these in any order. I've just put them here today for things for you to catch next time that you go out to do a panel change, or if you're a homeowner planning on pulling a homeowner's permit and doing your own panel change, you don't get popped on these. And one of them is labeling the panel. Yes, it is a code requirement. I know it's very surprising. So 404, excuse me, 408.4A requires you to label all circuits, whether they're modified or new or existing. You have to label all of these circuits. How many of you guys have ever went to a panel label like this? 18 and 20 have question marks on them. And we, we've I've had to do that in the past before myself when you really just don't know. Dryer labeled. These are scratched out and have been changed. You just have no idea. Or even worse, you come to it and it's completely blank. So one thing that you have to do, and lately our inspectors have actually been coming back to make sure that it's done, which is new, is you have to label the panel, which I agree with. How many times have you been trying to work on something and you have to flick off every single circuit in the house which if it just was properly labeled, you would have been able to go straight to the circuit and feel confident in it being off. Along those same lines, you have to be careful just because it's labeled water heater and you go turn off the water heater doesn't mean that that water heater circuit off. You still need to verify with at least two forms to make sure that it's off. Well, I hope these five quick points added a little bit of value to you and you will in turn go add value to others. I am the electrical code coach and I've dedicated my life to help you become everything that you can be in life and in the electrical industry. If I can help you in any way, you can always just email me at electricalcodecoach at gmail.com. Let's get to it.